Hi, I'm Varun Haran. I'm Senior Editor with Information Security Media Group. I have the pleasure today of speaking with Rashmi Knowles, who is the CTO for EMEA at RSA. We're going to be discussing the upcoming GDPR enforcement date and how organizations are coping with the need to comply with this directive and what are some of the challenges they're facing along the way. Rashmi is going to share some insight and recommendations for practitioners around the world. Hi Rashmi, thanks for joining us. Hi. So Rashmi, GDPR is just a month away. I think it was May 18th. 38 May. days I think it is. Yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, we've heard a buzz around GDPR for the past year or so, but uh, Strangely, the last six months have been very silent. Does that mean that yeah. organization has it lost steam? Have organizations lost interest in it? Or yeah. have they pretty much figured out what they want to do? Um, uh, probably all of the above. Yeah. And I would add a fourth one to that as well. And that's, um, it's not lost steam, but they're actually too busy trying to comply. So they're really worried about, you know, trying to meet the date. Um, and I, th I think, you know, there was, you're right, there was a lot of buzz. Everybody was talking about it. Um, so I think I see a number of different buckets. There are people who are ready or, or are confident that they know what they're doing. Um, there are others who need help but actually don't know where to start um, simply because they don't have the right resources, the right skills to try and do it themselves. And even if they go to third parties, they haven't got the resources to help them. So I think there's that group of people. And then I think there's a very small minority who are basically thinking we're gonna, we're gonna wait and see what happens to see if the fines actually materialize. Um, and then I think there are also organizations who for the first time have to do data protection. So because the definition of PII has changed, now you know if you just uh, process biometric data or something like that, you're gonna have to comply. So if you're doing it for the first time, obviously it's a much higher mountain to climb for sure, them. Sure, sure. So I think we'll come around to that, you mm -hmm. know, the changing definition of PII. But before that, uh, you know, a lot of these organizations out there, especially the big mature ones, the forward leaning ones, yeah. already have uh, significant investments in uh, uh, privacy and data protection, right? right? So how can they bring their existing programs up to mm -hmm. speed so that they can meet the requirements of GDPR right. without having to start from scratch? Yeah, and um, really good question because I think, you know, they're, they're all legacy systems. You know, if it's new, great, you can build it in. But for legacy stuff, you know, we've got to think about how we incorporate privacy. Uh, most large organizations, incidentally, would typically have a privacy program anyway. So they would run privacy impact assessments as part of that. Um, so, and, and a lot of them are doing that. But obviously now they have to do it for every single service that they offer. Um, so if they've got experience with that, then they're get going ahead and doing it. They also need to do data protection impact assessments together with a privacy impact assessment. So I think um, for some of those organizations, they, they're actually having to double up on, on that. Um, and of course, you know, with GDPR, you don't necessarily have to do um, a privacy impact assessment for everything. So, you know, it's a, a small portion of your services that you would have to do it for. Um, but I think, you know, overall, organizations are realizing that if it's um, how important privacy is, you know, if, if maintaining privacy of our customers and our consumers means that we can have much more valuable and trusted relationships with our customers, then they're actually seeing that as a good thing. There's an opportunity there as well. Absolutely, you know, data's money you know, as we've seen recently in the last few weeks. You mentioned the changing definition of PII, right? right. So uh, just for some context, mm -hmm. who set the definition in the first place? I mean, is it a commonly accepted definition across the industry? And what are the implications of, for organizations who didn't fall into the, yeah. under the ambit of yeah. privacy and data protection? So um, a PII, I think as an industry, we all kind of know what, what we mean by that. And typically it's, you know, name, address, home address, date of birth. You know, banking details, health information, that kind of thing. So it's basically anything that identifies you and me from that piece of information. Um, and that's commonly accepted definition. So for organizations who have to abide by data protection regulations, they are used to protecting that data. And then of course, you know, you've got things like PCI that protects, um, you know, financial information. You've got HIPAA for healthcare, etc. Um, but what's changed with GDPR is that you have that definition, but you also have uh, biometric information, you have email addresses, which you didn't have before, IP address, 
Um, so it's a different type of data. data. You've got ethnicity information, you've got political bias, so all kinds of other um, aspects um, that were not included in the original definition. It's pretty comprehensive, right? Definitely, So, yes. you know, some of the practitioners I've spoken to around the world in Asia, APAC, in mm -hmm. North America, uh, they, they seem to take the view that, you know what, GDPR is just so big and we don't know how enforcement is going to happen. So despite yeah. the 4% penalty yeah. uh, clause that exists, uh, they believe that, you know, whoever enforces it is probably going to go, you know, after the big fish first. Yeah, so yeah. small enterprises are fine for yeah. now. Do you share that view? Or? I, I think that the, the four, everybody focuses on the fine, incidentally, when you talk about GDPR. Um, I think the fines are deliberately big and they're intended to be used as a carrot because um, to really encourage companies to do the right thing because um, when the regulation comes into force, no one's going to knock on your door and say, you're not compliant, so here's your fine. What will happen is that organizations uh, will, it's, it's a continuously evolving regulation, so you're going to have to do it. And as long as you can show the regulators that you are on that journey, that you are doing the right thing, then obviously you're not gonna, they're not going to slap you with a fine. If you are a persistent offender, so you may have had breaches in the past, and, the regu and you have a breach and the regulators come in and you haven't got anything to prove that you know, your uh, record keeping is good or you've got all the right controls in place, then obviously you might get a fine. So I think you know, everybody focuses on the fine, but I think it's more important to focus on the fact that you know, it's been used as a carrot to get companies to do the right thing. And actually, it's a good thing. It's a positive thing, right? So you know, if it helps you build a more trusted relationship, um, it helps you revisit your, maybe your data governance practices, because now you're going to have to start from scratch. It helps you revisit your consent. So you, know, you may have accumulated a lot of data, um, but now you can actually say, you know, we can start from scratch, we collect the data, we know we've got consent, and therefore we can market to them. So I think there are a lot of positive things. It's an opportunity to revisit data security as well, because um, you know, most organizations start here and then they keep building onto it, and then you just end up with a big monster. But actually, if you kind of revisit what are we doing, uh, you know, minimize your data, for example, you know, a lot of companies have probably 70% of data that's not used. Great. So, great, great. so it's an opportunity in disguise and organizations need to take advantage of that. Definitely, right? yeah. Great, yeah. thanks. Thanks, uh, Rashmi, for taking the time and sharing okay. your insight. Thank you so okay. much. So that was Rashmi Noz, CTO for EMEA at RSA. For ISMG, this is Varun Haran. Thanks for watching.